The Defense Subcommittee will come to order. Today, the subcommittee will receive testimony from the Honorable Frank Kendall, Secretary of the Air Force, General David Alvin, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Chance Saltzman, Chief of Space Operations. Thank you all for joining us today. General Alvin, I'll note that this is your first appearance before this uh, subcommittee. Welcome and congratulations on your new role. Increasingly volatile world events since the hearing last year have underscored the importance of maintaining a strong and ready Air Force and Space Force. China is engaged in a historic military buildup, seeks to erode our military superiority. While China remains our pacing threat, it's not only threat we face. Russia continues its assault on Ukraine, and early this month, Iran launched its first ever direct attack on Israel. I'm pleased that we were able to get supplemental appropriations across the finish line to address emergent needs in these three regions. Our Air and Space Forces must be ready and able to respond across the globe if needed. We need to be innovative and agile with the goal of rapidly putting advanced capability in the hands of our airmen and guardians. For the Air Force, the fiscal year 2025 budget request is $228.8 billion. This is 2% more than an acted amount for fiscal year 24, which I note does not keep up with inflation. When budgets are constrained, trade-offs must be made and certain level of risk is assumed. Today we will discuss your proposed trade-offs in a constrained top line. One area that gets a lot of attention is the, is the divestment of aircraft, and this budget proposes significant divestments. On one hand, older airframes are less suited for modern missions, expensive to maintain, and parts are at a premium. On the other, quantity has a quality on to itself particularly in a perilous security environment. I understand that you have to prioritize to your constrained top line, but we need to understand the capability gaps this will create and your mitigation plans. We also need assurance that your bet on modernization over sustainment will yield success. And unfortunately, the track record is not encouraging so far. Just last week, we were notified of a Nun McCurdy breach for the MH-139 Grey Wolf. This follows the Sentinel's Nun McCurdy breach. We need to understand the implications of both of these breach reviews for fiscal year 2025 and beyond. I also hope to hear how the Air Force plans to address the acquisition delays for the, and mitigation plans to ensure there's no capability gap for the warfighter and the F-15EX, T-7, and E-7 to name just a few particularly uh, in cons of, our own, of all, all of our concern. On the bright side, I'm pleased to see that the Air Force continue to prioritize investments into B-21 and next generation air dominance aircraft, especially with the recent down select of the collaborative combat aircraft, two companies, one of which was founded just a few years ago. For the Space Force, the fiscal year 2025 budget request is $29.4 billion which is effectively flat funding compared to last year. Factoring inflation, this is a real dollar cut. In fact, the projected budget for Space Force remains flat at this amount for the, over the next five years. Budgets are obviously tight. However, given the increasing reliance on space capability and plans to pivot some missions from aircraft to space, I'm skeptical that a flat line level budget is credible to deliver all the capabilities needed. I'd like to know where you choose to take risks in a space portfolio in this year's budget. This committee expects programs to be well managed. One of the key reasons for establishing the Space Force was to bring a focused discipline in delivering capabilities on schedule and within budget. The Space Force continues to work in progress in this regard, a work in progress in this regard, I should say, especially when it comes to delivering ground systems and user equipment. For example, the Global Positioning System Ground Control System is more than $3 billion over budget, more than seven years late, and still has not been delivered. Further, your own assessment identifies the Space Command and Control Program and the family of beyond line of sight terminals as another challenging program that fail to meet schedule milestones and will be delivered late. The pattern is clear. The problem with space is on the ground. I hope you to hear your plans to ensure ground systems keep pace with the satellite developments. On a positive note, I continue to be impressed with the progress of Space Development Agency and their rapid development to acquisition process. This committee is willing to give the Space Force resources to take risks and pursue new approaches when warranted. 
and SDA has lived up to its investment so far. I think we can agree that there are challenges that need to be addressed, but I also know that the devil is in the details, and it matters how things are being addressed. I have been disappointed with the level of rigor in the analysis behind some of the department's program decisions and organizational proposals. This subcommittee is data-driven and will not accept proposals that are pre uh, presented simply as done deals. Another area of concern is the innovation in rapid fielding accounts, which has been a focus of mine. The request for AppWorks is $20.5 million, a substantial decrease from the last two years. AppWorks and SpaceWorks are critical to the defense innovation ecosystem, essential to expanding opportunities of non-traditional defense companies and increasing use of commercial technologies. I'll be interested to hear how you intend to get after barriers to innovation, if not through the AppWords and SpaceWords. Finally, we are aware of the challenge of the entire department is having with recruitment across all components. I want to hear about your strategy to recruit the airmen and guardians of today and the service leaders of tomorrow. We'll be working closely with you throughout this budget process to find ways we can accelerate the fielding of platforms needed by our warfighters today. With that, I'll yield to the ranking member, Ms. McCollum, for any opening remarks you would like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the courtesy. I'd also like to welcome the Secretary Kendall, General Alban, and General Saltzman. For fiscal year 2025, the President has proposed eight, excuse me, $832 billion within our subcommittee's jurisdiction for the Department of Defense, which is $213 billion for the Air Force and Space Force. The Air Force has requested a 1% increase, and Space Force remains relatively flat following a large growth year in 2024. Each of these dollars represents an effort to remain vigilant in our national defense and to ensure that America meets our pacing threats. We are operating under the umbrella of a Fiscal Responsibility Act, and I know the tough choices were made in this budget in order to conform to the, what the law will allow. As I said in the hearing with Secretary Austin, I hope Congress has learned the hard lesson that we should not hold a national debt limit hostage to arbitrary spending caps. So for those who have buyer's remorse over their votes last May and those who are now criticizing the overall levels in the budget request, I wish to remind them that the fundamental strength of our nation's defense is in the strength of our military personnel and their families. And that requires a whole of government approach. Our national security is supported through our entire budget, which includes health care, education, transportation, and not just the defense budget. Growing our technological superiority in the air and space domain are also critical. And it is as important as ever to educate and train the next generation of mathematicians, physicists, aeronautical engineers, and computer scientists. In addition, Congress set the department's hiring and new start schedules six months back by enacting a final appropriations bill in March. We must do better to break the cycle of continuing resolutions. And I turn to the budget at hand now and the modernization, which we know is a key theme for the Department of Air Force. It's concerning that several Air Force programs are still struggling. F-35 deliveries are delayed along with an associated plant repair and infrastructure projects. Mr. Secretary, we have discussed this several times in conversations now, and I hope that it's being resolved. It needs to be resolved. It needs to be resolved immediately. The Sentinel program is under a critical review because of time delays and major cost overruns. The uh, E-7 program has been delayed and the budget does not um, have an advanced uh, program for procurement. At the same time, the Air Force is proposing fielding new capabilities and required uh, complex technology development along with it. For example, I have to ask, how can we be assured that programs to support long-range kill chains will be a success when the Air Force continues to struggle with the existing programs of record? I'm also concerned about the state of the Air Force's infrastructure. It's deficient and it does not seem to be a high priority. 
We've discussed sinkholes at Vandenberg Space uh, Force Base, the uh, deterioration of runways, the early warning radar stations in Alaska. Climate change continues to have a high cost impact on our national security. Infrastructure at Guam still needs repair following last year's typhoon. And Congress should have acted on that. I hope we do so in the future. But most importantly, our service members need all of us, Congress and the Department, to do a better job working together to provide and maintain infrastructure necessary for them to be able to even do their jobs. Mr. Chair, as I close, 10 days ago we had a series of overwhelming bipartisan votes on the components of national security supplemental to support Ukraine, Israel, and the Indo-Pacific. I hope that that will serve as a model for improving appropriation bills and getting them approved expeditiously through 2025 because, as you pointed out, we don't have time to waste. Gentlemen, I thank you for your service to the country and for appearing here today. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. McCollum. Uh, Chairman Cole intended to be here today, uh, but is unable to present uh, his statement due to obvious disaster in Oklahoma. And certainly our prayers were those who experienced these terrible tornadoes in Oklahoma, Nebraska, and elsewhere. Uh, so without objection, as prepared remarks will be included in the record. Uh, I'll now uh, recognize uh, Ms. Uh, Ranking Member DeLauro for any comments she may like to make. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you to you and to Ranking Member McCollum uh, for holding the hearing on the 2025 budget for the United States Air Force and the Space Force. I want to thank our witnesses, Secretary Kendall and Generals Alvin and Saltzman, for appearing before the subcommittee today and for your dedicated service to our nation. You keep the nation safe, you keep our airmen and women and guardians safe, and you ensure our allies are supported wherever democracy and freedom are threatened around the globe. Through the fiscal year 2025 budget, Congress has a sacred duty to ensure the Air Force and Space Force have the resources to fulfill its mission to keep our country secure and ensure our service members are protected and well-equipped. The President's 2025 budget supports our brave airmen and women, guardians, their families with a 4.5% pay raise, furthers initiatives to improve access to health care and child care while addressing housing and subsistence needs. This is the full compensation package that our service members deserve and we need to deliver on all of those components. In the President's request, the Space Force budget is relatively flat following a large growth year in 2024. Meanwhile, the Air Force has requested roughly $3 billion more than last year. I would be remiss if I did not point out that the combat rescue helicopter is not included in the request. This helicopter is still flying a critical mission, and Congress supported this mission in the final 2024 bill by ordering an additional 10 helicopters to maintain production. I will continue to support this program and hope to hear more about the Air Force's plans for maintaining a strong combat rescue capability. I'm also interested to hear today about how the forces plan to balance their modernization efforts with management of existing programs. Additionally, I want to hear about how the Air Force and Space Force are addressing recruitment issues. Regrettably, the majority chose to inject culture war debates into last year's Department of Defense funding process, and I am concerned with how that might further hurt recruitment efforts, especially among women. We must do all we can to ensure that any American who wants to bravely serve in the U.S. Armed Forces and defend our nation feels that they belong and that they are now not going to be drawn into political warfare while confronting the legitimate threats to freedom, democracy, and above all, to our national security. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, your full written testimony will be placed in the record. Please give a brief summary of your statements. Secretary Kendall, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, members of the subcommittee. General Saltzman, General Alvin, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of the Air Force's FY25 budget submission. Department of the Air Force uh, budget request supports the national defense strategy. 
We appreciate the committee's support for the recently enacted FY24 budget and your efforts to secure timely passage. As you are aware, the six month delay has had a real impact. Uh, that time cannot be recovered, but at least we can now move forward with our urgent modernization plans. As I have testified before this committee repeatedly, time is my greatest concern. We are on a race for military technological superiority with a capable pacing challenge. Our cushion is gone, we are out of time. As we have briefed the committee at a classified level, the pacing threat moves steadily forward. Continued failure to provide on-time authorities and appropriations will leave the Air Force and Space Force inadequately prepared. We know this committee fully recognizes this, and we appreciate your strong bipartisan support. Our FY25 budget request complies with the Physical Responsibility Act. We are requesting $217.5 billion for the Department of the Air Force, which includes $188 million for the Air Force and $29.4 billion for the Space Force. The FY25 budget reflects an increase of 2.1% for the Department of the Air Force over the enacted FY24 budget, a 2% increase for the Air Force and a 2.4% increase for the Space Force. This does not keep pace with inflation, as was mentioned earlier, or with the 7% publicly acknowledged growth to China's military budget. To stay within the levels of the, of the FRA, the Department of the Air Force had to adjust our previous plans. The DAF-25 budget seeks to preserve the momentum behind our modernization efforts, particularly the work on operational imperatives that we initiated and that this committee supported in FY24. In order to preserve modernization, we have marginally reduced procurement and we have sustained our foundational accounts at levels we deemed acceptable, but no more. Because the Space Force budget is dominated by research and development accounts, we have had to marginally reduce the pace and scope of our Space Force modernization programs. Our first priority in the national defense strategy remains defense of the homeland, which the Department of the Air Force primarily supports through investments in domain awareness, air and space defense, early warning, and cyberspace defense programs. Our second priority is to deter strategic attacks against the United States, our allies, and our partners. The Department of the Air Force FY25 budget request prioritizes nuclear modernization to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Notably, the Sentinel ICBM program has experienced unacceptable cost and schedule increases and is currently undergoing a number of review. Department of the Air Force will work closely with the committee as that review reaches its conclusions. Third national defense strategy priority is to deter aggression and be prepared to prevail in conflict when necessary. The Department of the Air Force needs immediate and significant capability modernization to keep pace with the growing military capabilities of the PRC. The Department of the Air Force operational imperatives and the closely related cross-cutting operational enablers continues to guide our modernization program. The FY25 budget request includes $6.1 billion for these efforts. Finally, the fourth national defense priority is to build a resilient joint force and enduring advantages. This budget request invests to ensure that we can recruit and retain the force we need and so that our airmen and guardians and their families have the quality of life they deserve and can serve to their full potential. As we have briefed the committee, the Department of the Air Force is also currently undertaking a department-wide effort to re-optimize re to meet the demands of great power competition. The intent is to minimize both cost impacts and personnel or unit, or unit movements. We will work closely with the committee as we develop detailed plans. We do not anticipate any significant impact on the FY25 budget, and we have not requested funds for this purpose. The department also appreciates the committee's support for the DOD Quick Start Initiative that was enacted last year. The Department of the Air Force has obtained approval from the Secretary of Defense for two programs that will be initiated under this new authority. They are a more resilient national position navigation and timing capability and C3 battle management for moving target indication. Time matters, but so do resources. The United States is facing a competitor with national purchasing power that exceeds our own, a challenge we have never faced in modern times. China is actively developing and expanding capabilities to challenge strategic stability, attack our critical space systems, and defeat our ability to project power, especially air power. Conflict is not inevitable, but it could happen at any time. General Alban and I just returned from a trip to some of our key bases in the Indo-Pacific. We shall all be very proud of our men and women serving in harm's way and doing everything they can to deter and be ready for a conflict unlike any we've seen before. The Department of the Air Force FY25 budget request is focused on addressing these realities. We commit to working with the committee to secure timely enactment of this budget request. Thank you. We look forward to your questions.
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I now recognize General Alvin for his remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. Today, I am proud to represent the 677,000 total force airmen serving our nation. I want to thank you for your unyielding support, not only for those airmen, but for their families as well. As we look across the strategic landscape, we find ourselves in a time of significant consequence. The simultaneous demands of strategic competition with an aggressive and increasingly capable PRC and persistent acute threats from around the globe require the Air Force to maximize the readiness of today's forces while adapting our structures and processes to offer the best opportunity to prevail in an environment of enduring great power competition. Time is not on our side. The FY25 Air Force budget request reflects difficult choices. We've made trade-offs to keep the Air Force's operational readiness today at the minimum acceptable to meet the nation's needs while seeking to preserve the previous year's advances in modernization. The Air Force budget request also invests in the Air Force's most precious asset, its airmen, to ensure they remain the decisive advantage upon which the nation depends. Strategic deterrence is a key priority in our national defense strategy, and the U.S. Air Force remains committed to recapitalization of our nuclear force. We are actively supporting the process triggered by the Nunn McCurdy breach of the Sentinel program and will continue to pursue the path of a safe, reliable, secure, and effective ground leg of the nuclear triad well into the future. Our ability to support the national defense strategy priority of deterring aggression and prevailing in conflict demands a modern Air Force that is connected to the Joint Force and can close multiple kill chains in minimal time to control the tempo of a complex fight with a peer competitor. The F to that end, the FY25 budget proposes continued investments in the F-35 and the F-15EX, albeit with fewer than preferred quantities dictated by the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We remain committed to the advanced ba air battle management system of the NGAD family and systems, particularly the collaborative combat aircraft, which will allow the Air Force to deliver the affordable mass required to be effective against a very capable PRC. We're also committed to building forward basing that is resilient enough to enable continued sortie generation, even while under attack. To arrest the decline in our readiness, we have proposed modest increases in investments in flying hours and weapon systems sustainment to support them, while prioritizing investments in critical physical and cyber infrastructure. Our airmen are and always will be the deciding factor in any conflict our Air Force faces, and we are committed to their health, development, and quality of life. We have made significant progress thanks to Congress's support in increases in basic pay, adjustments to basic allowance for housing and subsistence to account for the macroeconomic factors they face. There is still work to be done. During our recent trip to the Indo-Pacific, Secretary Kendall and I saw dedicated airmen that were eager to accomplish the mission, despite infrastructure degradation caused by natural disaster and persistent environmental challenges, <coughs> as well as limited access to the health care enjoyed by most CONUS bases. The job of your Air Force has not changed since its inception. Support the defense of this nation through credible deterrence and unmatched combat prowess. To preserve that level of deterrence, we must maintain our readiness today, modernize our force for tomorrow, and provide the absolute best support to our airmen and their families. Success on any battlefield is a team effort. I want to thank the members of Congress and this committee for your past and continued support. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General. Uh, now uh, we'll move to General Saltzman for his remarks. General, you're recognized.
respond with unparalleled value to them. Thank you, uh, and we will begin with the questions. Each uh, member will be given five minutes for their questions and answers. When your time returns, Shiloh, you have a minute remaining. Uh, first, I'll recognize myself. Uh, obviously, the KC-46 is an uh, important aircraft uh, for us uh, to obtain. Air Force is in the process of recapitalizing this aging fleet of KC-135s, uh, which I think was the old 707 airframe, which probably the only plane on the 707 is still flying on the planet, is our fleet of, of uh, that aircraft. Uh, there's been some issues, obviously, with the, the KC-46, uh, but uh, one that seems to keep, never seems to go away is the remote vision system, the RVS, and, uh, and a stiff uh, refueling boom. Um, efforts to resolve both these issues are underway. It's been underway for a long time. I uh, understand there's a final design solution expected for RVS by the early FY26 uh, and mid F FY25, respectively. Until the deficiencies are resolved, the KC-46A will not be fully mission capable. Uh, Secretary, uh, we just heard this morning from the Chief of the Air Force Reserve that the delivery of KC-46, uh, for instance, at uh, March Air Force Base in my area uh, will be delayed. What is the problem and what are you doing to uh, resolve it? Uh, as, you, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, this issue with the remote viewing system has been there for quite some time. Um, it, it does not completely limit the aircraft. The aircraft is capable for uh, transmitting fuel to every aircraft in our inventory except the A-10. I think that that's the only one that at this point so we can't refuel. Um, and there are certain lighting conditions which make it difficult to do refueling. So the aircraft is largely operational and we're continuing to take delivery of them while we work through solving this problem. And I think the dates you said were roughly the dates. Uh, we're continuing to procure the KC-46 at a rate of about 15 per year, including an FY25. And we're starting to work on the transition to the next generation of refuelers, which will have to be able to uh, uh, survive in a more contested environment. Looking forward to getting that uh, resolved and getting the delivery on the KC-46 aircraft. Uh, innovation and rapid fielding to the warfighter have been uh, obviously top priorities of this committee and mine uh, since coming to Congress, which I consider a collaborative effort with, with DIU. Establishing a strong infrastructure for the defense innovation ecosystem is critical. And uh, FY25 request includes $20.5 million for AFWERTS Prime, which is a decrease of 83.3 million in 24 and over 130 million in 23 requests. Agility and autonomy prime efforts dropped from 70 million in F FY24 to 6 million in 25. I'm concerned the Air Force has decided to slash resources in a well known innovation hub. Uh, Mr. Secretary, what message are you sending to innovators if efforts' budget request has been gutted? in fiscal year 25. That's and given the importance question. of innovation, uh, can I get your commitment to support DIU with manpower, billets, and detailees for we can get this thing off the ground? But th with that, Secretary, uh, you're You won't find anybody more supportive of innovation than myself and my colleagues here, I think. Um, as, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we're putting about $6 billion into modernization under the operational imperatives. The guidance I've given to our acquisition people is to structure programs to get meaningful capability in the hands of our operators as quickly as possible. So that's what we're trying to do with our programs. But there's also an observation uh, that goes back some time that we've been starting more things than we can finish by a significant margin. We have to be more careful about the things we start and be certain that they're going to be cost effective and they're going to fit into our budgets in the future and lead to real field of capability. So we've been trying to pin, uh, pare back some of the things which have little if any chance of actually transitioning across the value of death to focus on the things that will. I've recently reached out to the directors of both DIU and SCO uh, to set up day-long briefings with them to go through all their programs to give them feedback on the things that they're working on that we think will actually get into our budgets. And in general, what we're working to do is try to ensure that we have a much more efficient and effective pipeline of new capabilities coming into the inventory as quickly as you can. The threat demands that. So you wouldn't find anybody, you won't find anybody more interested in uh, innovation and getting it fielded, but we also have to, given the budget constraints that we have, make wise decisions at the front end, front end about which things to pursue. 
Anything else, General? The, the only thing I would add to what the Secretary said is also in one of our reoptimizing for great power competitions, one of the things that we're looking at is having this integrated capability command. When we talk about the valley of death, we need to have the other side of the valley of death pulling, saying, bring this to me, and, and having this integrated into one entity that says, I have a single force design. I need this, I need this, I need this, and be able to match the innovative ideas to something that will make it into the force design. The Secretary said that dollar has a better chance of making it into, into meaningful capability sooner. So we're trying to also work on the other end to make sure those innovations are targeted and focused on a force design that's going to use them. Okay. Ms. McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this morning we heard from the National Guard uh, during the budget hearing a lot about a legislative proposal to move the Air National Guard um, members to Space Force. In the hearing, we were informed that 70% of Guard members wish to stay in the Guard. Um, and I expect that you are more than aware that our governors, the chairs of my governors included, um, were very unhappy about this proposal. 48 of the 50 governors signed a letter in opposition, as well as uh, all the states and territories. And as I mentioned this morning, as a state, former state legislature that had uh, the preview over the Minnesota National Guard, um, I can tell you that the states need to be consulted and need to be full partners moving forward in any major change such as this. So, uh, you know, one would wonder uh, why Congress should seriously consider this if our governors and National Guards are so opposed. Maybe, I wonder, were they opposed because they weren't consulted and their input wasn't sought before this proposal. So right now, this morning, it would appear that this would be dead on arrival. And the creation of a Space National Guard might not be the most cost-effective idea either. In fact, the, the Congressional Budget Office uh, said in 2020 that the estimated one-time cost of 400 to $900 million for additional facilities in each state and then anywhere from th uh, 385 to $490 million in annual operating costs. So I know the authorizers are looking at that. This is their preview. I look forward to their decision, and then we'll work with them um, as, as uh, finding funding as they move forward. So I, we had the conversation this morning. I thought it was only fair that, that you hear what this committee had to say. What I want to ask you about, though, today is cancer rates. Last year, we discussed about the high cancer rates in pilots and ground crews. Air crews and members had an 87% higher rate of melanoma and a 39% higher rate of thyroid cancer. Men had a 16% higher rate of prostate cancer. Women, a 16% higher rate of breast cancer. Overall, air crews, 24% higher rate of all types of cancer. In addition, Ground crews had a 19% higher rate of brain and nervous system uh, cancers, 15% higher rate of thyroid cancers, 9% rate higher of kidney or retinal cancers, while women had a 7% higher rate of breast cancer. Now, a new two-year Air Force study has found what appears to be a higher rate of brain and spinal cord cancer among children of service members at Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico. The Air Force has been saying that the three incidences of the rare cancers are not significantly significant, statistically significant. Yet those rare tumors are showing up among children with parents stationed at Cannon Air Force Base at higher rates than children with parents stationed at other bases or in the civilian population. And of course, the Air Force is still investigating cancer concerns among missiles, nuclear missile maintainers, and support staff. So, if this is about how we're keeping our troops and their families safe, if our service members are signing up to serve and they're getting cancer at 30 to 40 years old, or their spouses or their children now have life-threatening tumors, how is their quality of life affected? Not only do they have to worry about their own personal health, they have to take time off of duty to, for extended hospital stays and doctor's appointments. This will certainly impact retention, 
and will impact overall DOD health care costs. Secretary Kendall, your posture statement in a lengthy session is outlining the Air Force's role in taking care of its people, but it fails to mention about the health care or cancer. So please tell me that you're working to address this and what we can expect to see from the Air Force about these cancer rates. They are alarming, and I want you to know this committee is very concerned. Uh, Ranking Member, I'm, we are very concerned about uh, the possibility of increased cancer rates among people that are, are serving in certain locations in particular. We have a study, as you mentioned, on missile ears that's been going on for about a year now. It's well underway. We're trying to be very transparent about our findings and work very closely with, with our people. We're reaching out to uh, people who have served to try to get a better sense of what, what incidence of cancer really is. And we're working very closely with the VA on this. So we, we, are, we are just as concerned as you are about this. We're trying to get to the bottom of it and understand exactly what's happened and try to make sure that our people work in a safe environment. Do you want to add anything to that? I would just say, as the Secretary said, the Air Force School of Advanced Aerospace Medicine is doing as much longitudinally forward as backward as we can do because there's the correlation and the causation. We really need to figure out what some of the root causes are so we don't uh, we don't spend money where it's not going to be most effective for them and their families. But uh, to the Secretary's point on the transparency, that's the one thing we can do. That doesn't cost any money. And we are being very aggressive about that through the, our, our commanders and our leaders are, are letting the people know in the communities what's going on when it's going on. However, until we get to the final answer, we understand that that's not going to be satisfactory. So we are putting we are putting the Air Force School of Advanced Aerospace Medicine uh, on this as, as hard as we certainly can. Well, being of the Asian Orange generation, and um, I'll just I'll, I won't get too personal about this. Um, being to reunions and that Marine Corps reunions, hearing the stories of how things were impacted, knowing how difficult the Department of Defense and the DA made processing Agent Orange claims, the lesson we learned in passing the PAST PACT Act and moving forward on that. I know that you're working and looking at studying it, but for these families affected, looking and studying, we need to start making sure that they're included in how we're moving forward in addressing this. And um, I hear what you're saying. I just don't know that people are feeling the care the way that we want them to. So would you keep uh, the committee informed um, on a quarterly basis where you are on this? If you need more funding, more resources, we have to work with the NIH. We have to do whatever we have to do. But the atomic war veterans are, you know, still not recognized for their health concerns, in my opinion. And I don't want on my watch to be part of this committee, uh, nor do I believe you gentlemen want to be on your watch not addressing this expeditiously. I yield back. Uh, thank you, General Lady. Mr. Womack. Oh, is, uh, oh, Mr. Laro, well, let's see, how do we proceed with this? Okay, Mr. Womack. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Womack. Um, uh, Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, uh, again, thanks for being here. Uh, I understand you have to make difficult budget decisions. In my view, a top priority should be the capability to rescue our men and women who are in harm's way. I'm concerned about the service's decision to terminate the combat rescue helicopter program. In my view, the moral imperative to, quote, leave no one behind is critical to show our commitment to the men and women who risk their lives to protect and who defend us in all theaters of operation. Last year, the Air Force told this committee that a decision to truncate uh, CRH would limit the capacity for dedicated combat search and rescue, uh, uh, combat search and rescue forces available to the joint force. How does this decision ensure that no one is left behind? How do you plan to protect the men and women in uniform moving forward? Uh, uh, you know, what, what will you be doing in the future? Is, is there a replacement for what we're doing with the combat rescue helicopter? The, the search and rescue mission, uh, the recovery mission, is a critical mission for our force. Uh, what has changed and caused us to change our program is the threats that we face and the operational environment which we're likely to be committed. Uh, when we look at the mix of systems that we have and the capabilities that are in the joint force, 
we, we the, the type of helicopter that the 60 Whiskey is will work in certain circumstances, but not in others, in particular not against the most stressing threats that we, that we face. And also for a lot of recoveries in the Pacific over water, for example, you don't need that kind of a capability. You can use a, uh, a helicopter that's not specially equipped or very expensive. So we're looking at the mix. We think we have uh, acquired enough of the 60 Whiskies that uh, we'll be able to do the mission where it's the appropriate tool to do it. And we're starting to look at more survivable ways to do recoveries and provide airmen the chance to survive in, in other environments, particularly more contested environments. I'll let uh, General Alvin add to that if he wants to. The Secretary really covered just about all of it. We're not only looking at our joint partners uh, who do have uh, uh, additional capabilities, but also our allies and partners in the environments in which we all may also need them, which is when we think about the European context, we, we do believe that between our joint partners and our allies and part, uh, partners who have that capability, we would be able to have enough uh, capacity sufficiently. But the Secretary really nailed it. And when we talk about the Indo-Pacific theater, it's a different ball game. We have to understand how to get there over vast uh, distances and try and survive. We have our folks at the Warfare Center doing um, uh, weapon schools, um, integration exercise and tasks to figure out how through tactics, techniques, and procedures we can make it more survivable. And the, the combat rescue helicopter in the, in the HH Whiskey is not that significantly more survivable than, than, the, uh, than, the, than the Gulfs were and, or in any of the other that it, the, our joint partners have. So any more of that capacity did not yield that much more capability for us to do that. So we do need to solve that problem in the Indo-Pacific. And I would say with the, with the additional 10 that was, uh, I was added in 24, we're almost to the program of record anyway. So the program of record as designed with that additional 10, it almost gets us there anyway. So we almost have the capacity that was envisioned to begin with. Is it possible for you all to you know, share with us, um, given what you've talked about in terms of changing environments, changing theaters, et cetera, to really to let us know what your... Uh, what, what are your plans in terms of uh, replacing that capacity? Um, uh, 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 and, you, you know, at what stage is the development, um, uh, uh, at what stage are, are we in that planning uh, for, the, for the future? Um, um, uh, 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 the the Indo-Pacific is in the future, it, uh, you know, but Today we're operating in the Red Sea, so it's how do we um, operate there? What is our capacity going to be? And you, you know, and again for the future to let us know where, where that where that's going. But I worry about the near term uh, versus what that uh, future uh, environment is going to be. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, I, I agree, and, and I would say that the Indo-Pacific is not only the future; it's approaching us rapidly. But your point about today That's being true. the Red Sea and then and in uh, the Middle East, uh, with that, we we do have the capacity. Again, we between us and our joint partners, we do have you, the you capacity believe we to have meet the those capacity. needs. I do, I do. We do. Okay, I, I think it's important for this committee to understand and to know that is because what we don't want to do is, I say, uh, last year you told this committee the decision to truncate would limit the capacity for dedicated combat search and rescue forces available to the joint force. That was just last year. From the Air that's Force, it. yes. And so that's why we are working with our other joint partners and yeah. allies and partners. And with the addition of the additional 10% of the capacity that was added into last yeah. year, I believe we have sufficient capacity. Okay. If you can lend more clarity to that for sure. us, I think would be, would be helpful, at least for myself. I don't know about others. Um, let me just try to focus uh, on another aircraft. And in, in full disclosure, it's tied to my home state of Connecticut. That's the F-35. Um, many capabilities with the F-35. We cannot discuss them all here in an open session. Um, but do you know of any other tactical fighter in the world being produced that is as capable as the F-35? No. <laughs> okay. What advantage does the F-35 and the fifth generation aircraft bring to the fight? What positive feedback have you gotten from the recent deployments on the, on the jet, and what additional investments can Congress make to increase readiness of the F-35 fleet? Well, I would say uh, to begin with, the F-35 offers a, additional survivability, an advanced suite of sensors, and uh, integration into uh, into the fight that 
really we haven't seen before in in modern mm. combat. So that that survivability, the lethality of it, and the ability to penetrate deep in places that that other of our fourth generation aircraft can't, uh, in, including the the sense the the sensors and the radar that is coming. And that's why I want to say this is the difference. The F-35 we have is a good F-35. The F-35 on the horizon is the F-35 that we really need for the China fight. The one that has the tech refresh that gives us the capability to have those future, the, the future capabilities that meet the threat where it is. So it is, it is capable and it will defeat the threats that we have today. We continue to need the modernization and the new capabilities to meet the threat that is rapidly approaching. Mm -hmm. so I've been with the F-35 since its inception. Mm -hmm. um, and it is the best aircraft, uh, all-around multi-role aircraft, certainly in the world, and will stay so. But it's got to get to the next set of uh, technical upgrades. Block four is what, what it's called. Mm -hmm. And for the years I was in my previous position, we were trying to get to block three. The threat has not stood still. And we've got to continue to modernize and upgrade the aircraft as we go forward. And right now, uh, the contractors are really struggling to deliver block four to us. And that, that's our priority, is to get those aircrafts. That's one of the reasons we mm -hmm. reduced our buy about 35 a little bit in this budget. Uh, we had financial constraints as well, but we also are, are really uh, in great need of getting that, that next iteration of capability out of it. Mm -hmm. So does that for your, mean additional investments for the Congress to assist that process, or is it? What we need fundamentally is for the contractor to deliver mm -hmm. the capability that we've been but, promised. Yeah, but what, what are the obstacles to getting to block for? Uh, they struggled with uh, with the technology, with the software in particular, but also with some of the hardware involved in the in this. Each each major upgrade includes both hardware and software upgrades, and both have been a problem for this aircraft. Uh, mm -hmm. And I would I can't go as you said it's classified. Well, I can't go into a lot of details, but we can get you a briefing on the details Lovely. if you'd like to see that. Okay. And some of the subsystems are struggling as well. Uh, so it, it, it's been a combination of problems with different parts of the of the of the major upgrade. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank the gentlelady. Mr. Womack. Thank you. I am so glad you brought up the F-35 because I'm going to throw a softball question at the secretary. Um, you know, we're not the only people going to be flying the F-35. We've got a lot of allies and partners buying it through the Foreign Military Sales Program. And after an exhaustive and very lengthy process, uh, the decision was made to train foreign military pilots in my district, in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And I can tell all of you, the River Valley in Arkansas is very excited to hear the sound of freedom. Uh, beginning this fall, I guess, when the, when the Polish show up. Um, Secretary Kendall, how important is it to get our foreign partners trained on this amazing airframe and the impact it has on national security? Uh, it's critically important, and I think one of the best testimonials to the to the value of the aircraft is that the, the number of countries buying it keeps increasing. Uh, you know, we started with seven partners, and now we've got quite a few additional uh, people acquiring it. And it, it is critical for a number of reasons. A, it's cutting edge technology, but B, it allows us to interoperate very effectively, uh, train with, and fight alongside of our partners in the same way to be as effective as a total force as possible and to integrate into the rest of the elements of the force. So we're, uh, we're delighted that we're moving forward on having and getting that into under operation as well. That's going to be a major step forward to be able to train in the United States so we have plans. General Alvin? I was just going to second what, what the Secretary said about the value of being able to hold uh, training on fifth generation platforms. Uh, and I'm a little bit biased, but I would say we have the best pilots in the world. And if you're going to train, you want to train with the best. And I just think that helps our combat capability as United States Air Force, as the Department of Defense, and as a nation, if we can maintain the ability to train in the common tactics, techniques, and procedures, and be able to proliferate that throughout like-minded nations. I think that is a that is a value proposition that, that makes the foreign military sales training in the United States that much more. To stand up a mission like that is not easy, uh, and there are facility improvements that need to be made, and this committee has been very good to help us fund those. And uh, all of you have a standing invitation to come down and, and see the work that's going on and, and to see some of that training once it commences a little bit later on this fall. Uh, I want to ask a question about um, exercises because I, I note that there's an unfunded requirement amount of nearly a quarter of a billion dollars for uh, the Pacific Air Force exercises. Uh, General Alvin, uh, help me understand the 
importance of conducting these theater-wide exercises? How do they help our formations? Uh, how, how do they help us integrate at scale uh, and across domains? Well, thank you for that, Congressman. We, we certainly are uh, looking to uh, change the manner in which we do exercises. We have done uh, exercises in bits and pieces, and a lot of the exercises are done on the backs of the wing commands who understand how they want to try and get their formations within their wings more ready to do their piece of the fight. But if we're going to enter a fight in the Indo-Pacific where we have to do agile combat employment, complex situations where we need to be able to aggregate for effect and disaggregate for survival, that is complex, and that takes training at a larger scale. If you just do it in bit pieces, you won't find out where the holes in your swing are. You have to understand fitting it together in something that looks more like you may actually have to uh, experience in combat before you'll do that. So the increase in being able to do larger scale exercises, that's where you're going to find out where some of your weaknesses are. We haven't had the ability to do that as much as we'd like to, and so moving forward, I think that will help us advance our capability more effective in the Indo-Pacific fight. Yeah. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I'm going to reserve, um, you know, a, a, an opinion on this whole LP 480, uh, this legislative proposal that uh, Ms. McCullum brought up. I do think it's a bit dangerous, though, for us to enter into an era where we are usurping the authority of our governors. Forty-eight of them have expressed some discontent with the proposal. There is the option of status quo, and I don't know, you know, I've not thought through it completely, but as a guardsman, as somebody who has some unique insight into of some of the dual mission of, of our guard. I, I, I guess I would say this. I, I'm a little concerned. I saw some numbers on polling um, among these personnel. We're talking about a thousand people here and the prospect of some of them looking for other missions so that they can remain part of the guard is a bit of a concern for me. So I guess my last question would be, it, it, are we going to create a gap in here in capability? That would, that would ultimately be my biggest concern. Secretary? Um, there's been a lot of confusion, I think, about this. First of all, we deeply value the Guard itself. It's an enormously important component of our overall force. And we deeply value these people and the units that they're in. There's only about 578 people that will be affected by this. Uh, you know, the Guard is uh, over 100,000, so it's a very small fraction. The, this is a very unusual situation we have. We created the Space Force. And we took people out of the Air Force and other services, and we're taking people out of the reserve component. And we're under the, under the act which just passed last year, created a personnel management system for the Space Force so they could have full and part-time people and manage that very small force as efficiently as possible. We've got 578 people in the Guard, in the Air Guard, who are essentially orphans right now. And they, they really need to be integrated into the Space Force. The intent is to integrate them exactly as they are, to keep them in place, keep them in the same job, serving the same way, doing the same thing. So there's not going to be any change here. This is also, this is not a precedent for anything else. This is a very unusual, unique situation we created because of the creation of the Space Force. So we're trying to essentially clean up the battlefield or collect, fix this loose end, if you will, in, in the creation of the Space Force. Uh, General Saltzman uh, has an, a very small entity. I don't mean to say that in a derogative way, uh, but a very important one. His mission is absolutely critical to the country. And he needs to be able to manage that force, including the personnel in that force, as efficiently and effectively and as little bureaucracy as possible. So we don't want to go in the opposite direction that the Congress went in last year of giving the opportunity to do that under the Space Force Man Personnel Management Act by creating a whole new entity or by leaving, for that matter, the people in the Air Guard where we can work that out. We can make any of these things work if we have to. But by far the best solution is to actually integrate those people in the Space Force. And again, this is not an attempt to undo the Guard. It's a very small number of people. It's only six states that are affected. Uh, it's not a precedent for anything else. It's just a, a way to you know, make the Space Force into the entity that it needs to be to be effective. Thank you for clarifying. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. By the way, I've got to leave here in a minute and go meet with the City of Fort Smith Board of Directors who are here today. And I'm sure the first thing they're going to ask me is, how's our F-35 mission coming? So thank you so much. Since you brought up the F-35, just really quickly, uh, what, what's going on since I heard from some of our friends in UAE the other day? Um, what's going on with the proposed uh, purchase of uh, UAE uh, acquisition of the F-35? Are any progress on that? I don't have anything new on that. Let me take that 
for the Incap Mr. Chairman. As far as I know, it's there's there's no obstacle to that, that I'm aware of right now. Yeah. Uh, Secretary Kendall, um, as you're well aware, the Air Force is having trouble uh, retaining as many uh, many pilots because of uh, the private sector pays so much more money, better benefits, and, and, and those type of issues. Um, the Air Force uh, is competing, uh, and, and I, I don't know how they can continue to compete. So it, it, it's a major issue that we, we have to deal with. Um, the, what are the um, incentives that we have, if any, that can, can do that? There are people that can leave the Air Force to fly and then also be in the Reserves or National Guard or w w whatever you would call that. Uh, have you um, seen any improvements over the last two years of this issue? And, and then finally, what about the percentage of pilots who leave active duty uh, for private sector, and I've asked this before, join the reserves or National Guard. And we'll, we can get you some numbers on that. We do have a shortage of pilots, and we've been working to reduce that. The greatest obstacle to uh, uh, higher pilot production is the pipeline, particularly the availability of training aircraft, which are at a very, and that's one of the reasons we need to get the T-7 fielded to have a more reliable aircraft. So I've been visited the contractors involved in the maintenance of the T-38, and it's just it's a constant struggle to try to keep those airplanes flying and get people through the pipeline. Um, we are using bonuses very effectively. The Congress just gave us the authority to increase our bonuses for, for pilot retention, and I think that's, that was just put in place. And I think early indications are that that's going to be effective. Uh, we have a lot of pilots who are in the Reserve and Guard who are, are <coughs> commercial pilots you know, during their civilian lives and then still remain in the service part-time. And, and that's a very effective way to retain those people as well. Do you want to add some? I, I would just add to the, uh, to the retention initiatives. You know, we have often uh, offered the, uh, the incentives for, for re-enlistment or retention bonuses. Uh, what we've done, though, is we've actually <laughs> taken some data, and it turns out that the way we've done it in the past, sometimes we ask those uh, who are eligible for it, maybe within a year or a year and a half of when they're making or when, or when their sort of commitment is up. And we found out after lots of surveys that uh, they may have already sort of made up their dis their mind by that time. time. So in working with, with Congress, this new incentive program allows us to actually request it earlier and they can help shape their future rather than be shaped by a decision at the last minute. And we also find that it's not just about the pay for them. There are opportunities where depending on where they are in their life with their family, the opportunity to, uh, to perhaps get a preference for getting stationed somewhere or not moving, yeah, that's an alternative for them. They value that over the actual financial incentive. And so this is, we're starting our second year of doing that. So we're doing longitudinal analysis. That, as the Secretary said, the early returns are good, but we're finding out that we can just find more creative ways to meet them where they're at. And it's not just about the dollars and cents because they love to serve. Uh, we're going to continue to seek those to be able to maintain the retention. I will add that while we do have retention issues, it, it is, we are still filling 100% of our combat cockpits. Those are being filled as well as our training. We're, we're taking the risk and mitigating is in the rated staff positions and some of the other, but we still do need to plus up and, and retain as many of those pilots as we can. Well, on the other hand, there's a, also a training backlog for pilots. What are the root causes of this backlog uh, and how are you addressing it? And what additional resources do you need from us? Well, thanks, Congressman. As, as the Secretary said, uh, it really has been uh, getting them through the pipeline because of aging aircraft. So the T-38, uh, much older, and we had issues with the J-85 engine. And as the Secretary said, getting that T-7 here as soon as possible uh, with the aircraft that we need is really what we're focusing on with the contractor. We also have are looking at new ways of doing uh, pilot training and understanding ways that we can get them through the pipeline faster. And those are things like if you have a, a multi-seat aircraft where it's more like what the airlines do as far as the training, you can do more in the simulator. If you can do more in the simulator, you can preserve the pilot's time, fewer aircraft hours. So we are seeing those. We are seeing gains there, but unfortunately they've been masked by the supply issues and supply chain issues that are limiting the availability of the aircraft. So if we can get through those supply and supply chain issues, I think that's where we're going to see the fruits of the labor of these other initiatives that on their own are increasing the number of throughput pilots that we can get. you are back. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Anderholt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just want to 
mentioned, you know, that Congress has been remained troubled about the uh, how Space Command location was selected. And uh, as you saw the language in both the NDAA and the FY24 budget, uh, Ms. Secretary, uh, just wanted to get your commitment that you will uh, continue to follow congressional intent as expressed by the laws that we passed and especially uh, let the independent investigation uh, run their course on this. Uh, obviously very familiar with the issue, Congressman, and uh, we will certainly follow the law and cooperate with the investigation in turn away. Thank you. I appreciate that. And let me ask about the space access mobility and logistics. Um, in a recent testimony, uh, General Saltzman, you, uh, to the Ar Senate Armed Services uh, Committee, you uh, talked about $20 million in this year's president's budget for space access mobility and logistics and said the funding would be used, quote, used to study and figure out if there's military utility um, for much needed capabilities like in space refueling. Uh, according to public reports, China has already found utility for in space refueling and they've demonstrated this uh, capability in 2021 and 2022 and have integrated lessons learned into military doctrine. So would it be accurate to say that the uh, DOD is going to study a capability that our adversary is already executing? And could you talk about that? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. It's, I have two things to say on that. One is uh, we are evaluating the military utility. As uh, Secretary Kendall mentioned, we want to make sure that our S&T budget goes as far as we possibly can, and we want to make sure if we're going to pursue a technology, there's a pathway to fielding an operational capability. So that's part of the assessment. But then from a mission standpoint, uh, we're rapidly trying to shift from large satellites in geosynchronous orbit whose uh, lifespan requires them to have a lot of fuel where refueling could be valuable. We're shifting from that kind of architecture into a proliferated low Earth orbit set of constellations. We're talking hundreds of satellites, much smaller and more easily to replace. So the idea is that you wouldn't need to refuel them because you're trying to re replenish that um, that proliferated constellation on a more frequent basis. So three to five years on orbit, replace it with updated technology, wouldn't necessarily require the same level of servicing on orbit. So we're trying to get the balance just right and make sure that all the dollars that we invest would be properly utilized. Oh, uh, Secretary Kendall, you got anything you want to add to that or? Well, I think General Salzman had it just right. Oh. Well, how would additional resources for the space uh, access, mobility, and logistics be helpful and ensure the continued U.S. space superiority? Well, w one area, of course, is the launch infrastructure. A lot of this comes when we talk about space access, mobility, and logistics, one of the key pieces is space lift infrastructure. Uh, and the uh, dramatic increase of commercial launches at our two primary uh, launch locations at Cape, near Cape Canaveral at Patrick Space Force Base and out of Vandenberg, uh, that's taking a toll on its infrastructure and we need to recoup that and keep that up. So that's keeping that infrastructure current and capable of supporting the ops tempo is going to be a primary resourcing concern. Okay. I'd just add to that that the biggest, and General Saltzman should comment on this too, um, the, our greatest regret, if you will, in the constraints that we had this year was we couldn't move forward more quickly on counter space capability in particular. Um, the, 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 our pacing challenge is fielding a number of systems that threaten the joint force and that essentially are targeting assets like aircraft carriers. We need to have the capability to do something about those assets so that they can't provide that tar targeting service to, to the Chinese military. And that would be the highest thing on our list of, uh, of things that we aren't able to move forward as quickly as we'd like to on. I see my time's going up. I yield back. Thank the gentleman, uh, Mr. Case. Thank you, uh, General Saltzman. Um, your budget came to us at um, a reduction in uh, of two percent after, of course, um, four years of significant growth. But we would expect that growth given that you're five years old. So we're trying to obviously ramp up as fast as possible. 
And although I guess you could say a, a 2% budget uh, reduction is, uh, well, thanks for that, because we've got a lot of demand. Still, it begs the question of, of what risks we're accepting in, in your trajectory uh, to get you as, there as fast as possible. Now, I, I understand that, I mean, the, the reason advanced really for the budget reduction has been a lower pace of space launches, uh, which, um, and one of the questions is what kind of risk does that present? But I also just took a look at your unfunded priority list because the real concern here is that in a, in a, in a budget pressured environment, um, where the real consequences is being taken is in, is in some of the baseline infrastructure. So, you know, staff training, um, infrastructure capability, MILCON, training facilities, exercises, so, um, and I did, you know, your, your, your UPO list does have some of that. It looks like some, some, um, some MILCON, some, some training exercises. So I guess, I guess my real question is, other than for us to just say okay to the 2% reduction, I mean, what are we actually doing here? What, what is this going to do to your, the direction you're trying to take? Because we're trying to get you to somewhere as fast as possible. Well, I think you got it just right, and I think Secretary Kendall mentioned the, the, the biggest regret, of course, is the lack of counter space capabilities. And so the budget includes a, a pretty substantial investment in this shift to more resilient architectures. So we're on a good path there. Uh, it has good investments in operational test and training infrastructure. So I like the idea of training our operators against the thinking threat. What I'm most concerned about is how fast we're able to put those counter space capabilities to hold at risk the, the PRC targets that Secretary Kendall mentioned, the ones that can, uh, uh, it's space enabled targeting of the joint force. That's the biggest concern and what this budget needed to do was slow that acquisition down. So the programs are still there, um, we're still making progress, we're just not putting it in place as fast as possible. Okay, I'm sorry, Secretary, anything to add? No, it's a Okay. Um, um, General, just some of the same questions uh, to you just in terms of, 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 of your budget and taking a look at your unfunded priority list. Um, Mr. Womack, I think, talked about your, your exercises. You're, you're, you're not adding some exercises in PACAF specifically in the agile combat space that you would otherwise want to do, right? That's, but the one that really kind of, and, and you've got a MILCON of $1.115 billion, and I think we all know that you're that your MILCON is a, is, a, is a huge gap right now, especially if you take a look at your agile combat plans out in the Pacific. You just saw that again. The one that really struck me when I took a look at it was um, spare parts, $1.566 billion. Um, and it, it says here, funds single spares restock for aircraft projected to be grounded due to a lack of spare parts. I mean, that sounds pretty serious, actually, to me, to be in a UPA list, number one. And then number two, we've had a lot of discussion on the committee about um, um, just basic, um, you know, industrial base ability to produce. Is this an issue of a supply chain disruption, or is this the parts are available, but we just don't have the money to buy them? Congressman, I think it was, it was more of the latter. But the, the Department of Defense did uh, put an emphasis during the budget submission and the contemplation about, about readiness. So I, I did not want uh, this committee to, to believe that, that, that the DOD did ignored readiness. But what happened is this year, as we looked at some of the continued erosion and we looked at the strategy that we talked about, I went to uh, our Air Force Material Command Commander and our Air, A4 and said, asked them to do a sprint. Let's, let's deep dive into some data-driven analysis that can drive from inputs to outputs where you can say, if I put a dollar in here in this spare part, what can it, what can it deliver out there? And we, we have really just developed the data platforms to be able to do that with rigor. And so that happened during the summer and the fall. And we focused on aircraft and weapon systems that we had more control of, the, of all of the organic aircraft, the C-130s, the B-52s, those where we had a lot more control over that entire supply chain process and, and the supply parts where we could visualize throughout the system. And then looked at which of those which we knew had limitations because of spare parts, because we had that across our Air Force, which ones would drive the biggest change. And when we saw that, they came up with that analysis and it was complete, but it wasn't complete in time for the budget submission. My sense is if it had been done there earlier, I would have gone to Secretary Kendall and said, maybe perhaps we could put this in. But when I saw the, the potential output, I couldn't, it didn't seem like I could wait another year for the next budget submission. So it really was a matter of sequencing because we didn't want to just put in a wedge and say, give us more money for parts. I wanted to be able to have some specificity to show the drive, the input to the output. And I feel like we had confidence enough to where I could submit that in my unfunded priority list uh, because I don't, 
I would rather not wait another year to, to fight in the submission. Okay, thank you very much. Thank the gentleman uh, next to Judge Carter. Uh, Jill Salzman, the Space Force recently announced the creation of a Space Futures Command. Can you talk about the goals of this command and its timeline? And can you give us examples of what types of missions this command will look at? Thank you, sir. I appreciate the question. The Futures Command came out of our uh, analysis associated with optimizing for great power competition. And we became aware of the fact that, that while there was a lot of disaggregated activities across the entire force and, and the entire department, quite frankly, associated with trying to build the force that we're going to need in the future, it wasn't coherent enough so that we could understand what the second and third order effects of any one decision were. So what Futures Command does is it aggregates all those capabilities together. It will look at operational concepts, which technologies will be most likely to be used against us or that we can leverage against future threats. What are the missions that are going to be expected of us in the future? It will evaluate all those operational concepts, wargame them, do tabletop exercises, do some experimentation to validate those concepts, and then finally do the real hardcore data analytics that results in a force design so that we can build the requirements and, and buy the kinds of capabilities that we know we're going to need in the future. All of that would fall under one field command. And when do you expect to stand this up? I'm, I'm hoping that from a process standpoint, later this summer, early fall, we're actually working through the processes. It's going to take me a while to put a command structure in place. There could be a basing decision, and that'll take a little more time to put in place. But process-wise, because a lot of these are already uh, occurring across the Space Force, we'll pull them together coherently and work the processes later this fall. Is it going to be an issue of location? We're going to have to look at that as a part of a basing process. The Air Force recently announced the next phase of the Collaborative Combat Aircraft Program. And I understand that you're exploring international partnerships as part of this program. Can you elaborate on what it would look like and the benefit of this partnership might bring to further development of, of the program and the utility of it across the partners, our partners and allies? Uh, the Collaborative Combat Aircraft Program is the uncrewed, you know, companions, wingmen, if you will, to, to manned aircraft. I uh, started out as a, as a companion for the next, next Generation Air Dominance Platform, but also could be used by an F-22 or an F-35 or, or an F-15. And we just down-selected, as you mentioned, Congressman, to two companies for the first increment. The way the program is structured, it has multiple increments. They're about two years apart. And the first one will go quickly to production. We expect to have that, that those aircraft in production within within the next few years, and have deliveries before the end of the five-year plan. Um, they're going to allow us to learn a lot. They'll give us an operational capability. I mentioned earlier that we're trying to make sure we field meaningful operational capability as quickly as possible. So that first increment will give us some degree of capability. There'll be a second increment coming along a couple of years behind that one, um, and we are particularly looking for international cooperation with that second increment. Uh, we've had talk with General Alvin and I both have had talked with several of our partners, our closest partners who would be who are very interested. So it's early stages, but we would like to go in that direction. We think this will be something uh, that could have great value to all of our partners and, and enhance our capabilities, you know, uh, particularly in partnership with our with our closest allies. Do we have anything to that? The only thing on that is the secret sauce there that I think will enable us to be more rapidly integrating with our allies and partners is part of this entire concept is a, is a government-owned reference architecture, something that we control. And so as we are seeing advancements in the technology, we can maybe set the pace for how we can integrate and work with our allies and partners. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the big things that's going to let us go faster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just uh, following up on the uh, judge's question, uh, on the uh, – on this aircraft, the collaborative aircraft, what do you envision? How many aircraft are we talking about here in the next five years? Um, we'll, we'll have over 100 on order or delivered by the end of the fit up. Uh, we, that's for increment one. The planning figure I've given people to use is 1,000. Uh, and that's just really to reflect the fact that we're serious about this. This is going to be a significant part of our force structure. Um, the ultimate number is going to depend upon uh, all the uh, cost, 
affordability and a number of other factors. But th this is a fairly transformative change to going away from you know individual fighter pilots all out there at risk together to giving the giving our fighter pilots a a, a wingman that that can be attributed to a degree. It's intended to be survivable, but attributable. Uh, that'll give us uh, a wide range of tactics and techniques that we currently can't can't utilize. And so it's it's going to become a mainstay part of the. And fleet. so and so each say F thirty five for instance. How, how many collaborative aircraft do you think would be attached to a single F thirty five? We won't do it for every single fighter, probably at least not initially. Uh, but nominally, t t two to two to five. For example, under the control of an individual pilot, and the cost I read in the in the press reports are approximately thirty million a piece. Does that sound about right? We're, we're looking for something that's a fraction of the cost of a fighter. So, so hopefully less. On so hope the order of twenty-five or thirty million a piece would be kind of what I would consider personally an upper bound. Yeah, I would hope so. I would hope that cost can come down considerably. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Captor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, uh, generals, welcome. And to all your staff, thank you for the patriotic job that you all do. I wanted to uh, go to General Alvin first, uh, if I might. Uh, what is the Air Force learning from the Ukraine theater and uh, operations there that would inform our posture toward uh, future uh, flight and uh, future fights? Well, thank you. I, and I, I hesitate early on to talk about lessons learned. We certainly want to want to to learn what we can, but understanding the context is important. I believe that there are a couple things. Uh, as an airman, it reminds me is that I don't think you want to fight without some level of air superiority, because that's where we are right now, and that's painful for both sides. But I think the the advancements in uh, in the in the UAVs and the drones and what that means for a change in. In, in the ability to retain air superiority long enough to be able to have those uh, the, the, the overall combat objectives is is a little different depending on where you go. We want to make sure that even though we have massive you know swarms of drones that works in the European theater, when you have a different theater, you have to think of a different context because there's much more range, and so you wouldn't be able to use them the same way. But I think that the the idea that the electromagnetic spectrum may be one of the biggest lessons. That still matters more than we did before because the ability for those uh, crewed or uncrewed aircraft to be effective in there really depends on how well they can uh, defend against, uh, they, they can jam against or defend against jamming and survive in the electromagnetic spectrum. That and the innovation that's happening within the conflict are things I think are things that we need to be prepared for. We need to solve for agility to make sure that we can we can adapt to those maybe lower cost but asymmetric capabilities that pop up early up in war, in, early in wartime. Thank you uh, very much. Um, let me ask any one of you if the uh, boards of education that I represent across northern Ohio and our community colleges wanted to connect to any of your cyber training or cyber possibilities for younger people that holds the potential for recruitment as well as workforce development uh, on the private side. Uh, if we have interested teachers and their students, who do we contact? We'll get you someone to talk to about that. We're very interested in that. You may not be aware, we just created a uh, new category of, of airmen, warrant officers in the cyber and IT fields. So we're very much interested in expertise in that area and having people come in who want to work in that area and stay in that area during their career. So we, I'll get you a point of contact and we'll have someone work with you on that. I hear there might be a cyber command that was established in uh, Cincinnati. I'm not sure who that's done through, whether it was Wright Pat or I, I don't know the university there, but it's not connected to the places that I represent. So I'm just curious uh, to be connected to the right place at Air Force. Ohio's the state of flight, so we have to protect our own. And uh, we want to engage our educational um, community in that effort as well. Uh, uh, 20 years ago, uh, at the 180th Fighter Wing in uh, Western Ohio, uh, a biofueled F-16 was flown successfully. I'm interested in how you, Mr. Secretary, or any of you, think about fueling the future and uh, in craft that are airborne. Uh, just curious how you think about that. I think in general, uh, uh, Congresswoman, the, the idea for us is, is fuel fuel conservation is not only just good for the planet, it helps us in our mission as well. So anything that we can do that can preserve 
uh, duration, endurance, regardless of the type of fuel, uh, that's what we're looking for. But before we, we transform into the sort of the fossil fuel uh, platforms that we have into something into the future, we need to ensure that it is sustainable and it's something you can, we can take with us into combat. But the idea that we would op- always be looking at operational energy and being able to, to better use that, it actually enhances our combat effectiveness as well. Uh, should we be um, apprehensive about the Space Force and the uh, uh, current air uh, responsibilities that our region holds? with F-16s and potentially F-35s because of the uh, dawn of Space Force? Or do we have reason to be worried that we're going to lose our fighter wing? I'm not aware of any reason why you would be. All right, well, that's good news. Finally, uh, what about the um, balloon that flew over the country? What did we decide that was? Uh, the one that, there was a Chinese balloon that came by, and uh, uh, it's, I'm not sure how much I can say that I'm being getting into classified. You know, it was very visible. People, you know, were aware of it. It was shot down. Um, the Chinese claimed that it was not an intentional on their part. I'm not sure that we believe that. Uh, I, I think we've raised the awareness of that kind of threat quite, quite, a, quite a bit, uh, and we're on the on the alert for those. We have seen some other cases where balloons have come close, if not come over the United States. Thank you, so Mr. Secretary. Yeah, we could get we could give you much more at a classified level. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. I don't know why they don't just put that debris on display someplace and let the American public look at it and make their own decision. I think we all know what that decision would be, uh, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll thank the three of you uh, for being here today. Thank you for your service uh, to our beautiful country, uh, Mr. Secretary. Congratulations on CCA. Uh, two outstanding choices there with uh, Andrew and uh, General Atomics uh, and looking forward to seeing that program uh, accelerate and actually it's a paradigm breaking acquisition uh, model uh, as well as uh, source selection. So really appreciate it. Survivable but uh, tritable uh, was actually my call sign in the Navy. So uh, that, uh, that's a good thing to see. Ho- hopefully that's not a black cloud for CCA. Um, you, we're in a unique uh, era right now where you're trying to balance capability with capacity. I've been very adamant that I don't know that we have a uh, capability gap relative to China. I think that's a fight we always keep fighting, but I think we do have uh, unique capabilities, high in exotics. But the capacity uh, is the challenge with the force projection of you know three or four thousand miles and not in our backyard like what they enjoy. So now we're in an era where you see, you know, the first flight of B-21 happened this year, but also the service life extension of B-52 out to be a 100-year-old platform with new radars, new sensors. Uh, you see Teddy Roosevelt's vision of F-35 finally being realized with uh, tech refresh and now also F-15 EX capacity supplementing that capability. Uh, I think these are good things, JADC-2 ABMS uh, maturation and some classified programs. So. Uh, I don't envy your jobs, but I think overall uh, at, the, at the macro level, the Air Force is doing a good job of, of executing that, that pivot to the Pacific and maintaining the capability advantage while also addressing the capacity challenges that uh, we have. So uh, just, just wanted to give you kudos for that. Um, uh, my concern is around the T-7 and how we can go faster. I've been af- asking this question for a few years. Um, uh, Mr. Elsey and I lost a good friend in the uh, T-38 accident back in 2019 out of Enid, Oklahoma, 47-year-old uh, naval aviator who did an Air Force transition. He was in the back seat. Uh, that T-38 aircraft was not a good trainer in the 60s or 70s. It sure as hell is not a good trainer today. Uh, and it's the widow maker. I think, I think it's killed about 149, 150 uh, aviators or pilots, excuse me, uh, sorry, um, since, since it's come on online so are, what are we doing is it a Boeing limitation is it a material limitation what can we in Congress do to help accelerate the T7 um, to avoid T38 deaths in the next call it two to four year period I, I'm not aware of anything you can do to make the program move faster we had the slip production uh, out a year because of the trying to negotiate and get the cost down and deal with some difficulties that have occurred in development. You may be aware we've had yeah. problems with the ejection seat and mm-hmm. ejection system and with some of the controls. So I think that we're working our way through those. I could get you uh, a more detailed report. General Alvin may have more information than I do. I, I think this is some of it is in, in general, I, and I, I don't want to speak for Boeing specifically, but there are some growing pains when you start with 
uh, sort of a new way of, of building and designing. This started with more digital engineering, and so there, there, were, there may have been some things associated with that that sort of hindered the pace of the development. Uh, I'm encouraged the fact that it's in flight test now. Um, I think that this is where we can perhaps accelerate. Um, but as the secretary said, it really is just by getting it through this developmental test and, and buying the first ones next year, you know, in 26. Okay, well, I, I would just encourage you, if you see any opportunity to accelerate either through parallel risk reduction, I know there's going to be concurrency risks that come with that. This, this isn't as, as exotic as the F-35, so those, those penalties won't be as severe. But, you know, uh, Matt Kincaid's widow is, is, is out there in, in Oklahoma still, uh, and she's looking at this very closely, and, and, and I, I think it'll save lives if we can go faster. Uh, my last uh, request, uh, General Saltzman, if we can get uh, in the skiff at some point, you mentioned a program today that we as a committee have grave concerns over um, but we can't talk about it here that um, is very relevant right now and very timely discussion I think would be needed in the SCIF if, if we can at some point. Happy to um, do that. I, I took a brief at Space Command. I think actually uh, the chairman was, with, was there as well uh, in El Segundo uh, about a year ago now when, when, uh, we were, when you were promoting uh, Buzz Aldrin. And uh, um, I, I want to follow up on that uh, if we can at some point. Uh, but I think it would behoove Mr. Chairman for the, for the, the, the whole subcommittee to hear, hear the, what's going on there. But uh, with that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I remember that uh, meeting with General Alden uh, very well, as we can call him now. With the Secretary's help, by the way. I, I appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, Mr. Elsie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. It's nice to see you. General Saltzman, are the lights in here in this windowless room okay for a missile ear? Is it okay? All right. <laughs> I'd like to thank you and your fellow missile ears for what you do. There is no way in Hades I could, I could do that. So thank you for taking the strain. You're the perfect guy for this job right now on expanding space capabilities. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here. We've never met before, but uh, I, I just would like to ask what's wrong with the Air Force Academy that they can't find the Secretary of the Air Force for themselves that they would require a, a West Pointer. It, it defies logic, but uh, glad you're here. And, and of course, from your years in acquisition, you are the right guy for these these times as well. And uh, and General Alvin, your your history as a as a heavy guy, uh, hauling uh, logistics is is the right. You're the right man for that job right now too. So it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, General, I'd like to start with you. Uh, by the way, someday it's going to be Admiral because. You know, Star Trek. It was the fleet, oh, Star yeah, Fleet. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna do that before I leave Congress. <laughs> Sadly, on November 29, 2023, we lost a V-22 from AFSOC. Um, and then on December 6, 2023, after watching a video, the AFSOC commander downed the whole fleet. Uh, there were some issues with it, which I won't go into here, uh, that led to that mishap and varying mishap rates between the different services. Uh, on March 8th, the Naval Air Systems Command deemed the V-22 safe to fly based on a meticulous and data-driven approach that prioritized safety. And then just days later, uh, the Marine Corps and the Japanese started flying them, and the Navy has as well. We talked to the SOCOM commander a couple of weeks ago, and he said, he said their operations have been severely impacted in, in this room. That's where I'll leave it because of the V-22 grounding. So I've spoken to the AFSOC commander, and he can't give me a timeline for a return to flight. It's been six weeks since the Marine Corps and Japanese started flying, as well as the Navy. That's a long time considering the operational impacts. And I want to know when the V-22 is going to start flying again. Well, again, I know, and uh, the AFSOC commander, General Ballenfrein, spoke with me as well, and we, we, we keep in touch very frequently about, about this. Uh, so I can tell you right now that uh, three of the platforms I've gone through FCFs, they've gone through the functional check flights. And so we, we are making a deliberate approach, but it is, it is a comprehensive approach because the manner in which, as you know, the, the CV-22 is used in the Air Force is really much different. And so he is in lockstep with the Joint Program Office and his sister services in, in understanding how and why they are returning theirs to fly. But he's taking AFSOC in, in a deliberate manner to ensure um, every one of the, the maintenance records are checked and every one of the crews are, are ready to fly. And so he's, he's taking a deliberate approach and a comprehensive review on the weapon system, on the crew complement, on the mission set, and how it's unique uh, to the Air Force and AFSOC. Okay. Well, I got the same answer from him, and I, quite frankly, how he downed it based on a video that uh, was preemptive to a mishap investigation. I was a mishap investigator. I flew helos and jets. 
uh, quite frankly, he, the decision to do that should not have been approved, and it hurt our national security. That is my take on it. We'll move on to a different issue. Um, let's talk about acquisitions. And like I said, Mr. Secretary, you're the right guy for this, but it seems like we keep making these mistakes over and over and over again. And, you know, the B-21 is a great program. The F-15EX was a great program. Future long-range assault aircraft is on timeline. But when we talk about Nunn McCurdy and the 139 Gray Wolf, it's a helicopter. Um, the Sentinel, which I know is a lot more complex. Uh, but in our own service, um, the FFG, the DDG-1000, the LCS, the Presidential Hilo, Air Force One, the Ford's three years behind, the F-35 got cut, F-22 got cut, T-7 was behind timeline. So my question is, and I'm, and I'm asking this in a way that is completely innocent. I have no agenda here, but I really want to know that after decades of doing the wrong thing, do we have a requirements issue? Because I think in my service we do. do are, are we underestimating uh, supply chain issues and we're just catching up to them? Or is it a lack of business sense and acquisitions? And, and I'm not trying to lead you down the right answer. I really just kind of want to know. How long do you have, Congressman? 40 seconds. <laughs> Um, I've, I've, I've done this. Oh, for, good. We get an ex a minute of extension. I've, I've got 50 years of experience with new product development, basically. And I've seen us get in trouble the same way over and over. Um, and you had the list. It's not always the same. But unrealistic requirements, unrealistic schedules, lack of appreciation of technical risk. I mean, all of these things. And uh, there have been there has been an effort to chase, I think, what I call acquisition magic a few times, which is somebody comes up with a new idea they think about how to do it. Uh, usually it involves taking extraordinary risk, and then we pay the price for that. Um, putting amateurs in charge doesn't work very well. Uh, the things we ask people to do to develop new weapon systems for the United States are hard things. We're asking them to build, build weapon systems that are a generation ahead of anything ever built before. There is inherent risk in that. And you have to plan and manage that risk. You have to take risk mitigation steps. Uh, you have to understand deeply what those technical risks really are and then what's appropriate to try to reduce that risk or to manage it. So you have alternatives if you, if you encounter it. Uh, there's no substitute for professionalism. Um, there's this idea that we're, we can go much faster if we just you know, somehow weighed our, weighed our arms and created a different set of structures. That tends to just get you in trouble. Uh, you can be overly conservative, but I think that's the exception. Most of our programs overrun uh, in development by about 25 percent. That's the average. In, in early production, they overrun by about 10 percent. And when I was running the acquisition for DOD, we were able to drive that down. Uh, but it's, you know, you mentioned a couple of the programs. B-21 is one that Dr. LaPlante, who's now the ANS uh, Undersecretary, and I put together. But when we take wild chances, we get the results you should expect. So that, that's very in a nutshell. So we, we don't want to be, I, I would tend to structure programs to be somewhat aggressive, but not so much so that you're guaranteeing failure. That, that's really the key to success. But you got to really understand what you're doing. There's no magic answer. Just put my two cents into this. I, and I've been here for a while, 30 some years. And uh, I was here when we started the F-35 program. I remember the people bringing in the PowerPoints and say this is going to be the Swiss Army knife of all fighter planes. You know, we're going to have a single frame, three variants, uh, we're going to use a single engine. It's going to bring down our maintenance cost, our hourly cost, it's going to our per unit cost and all that. And we're going to get rid of the F-16. We're going to get rid of the F-18. We're going to get rid of the F-15. We're going to get rid of the A-10. We're going to, you know, this is going to be it. And uh, uh, and we're building more F-18s. We're building F-15X. Uh, got an upgraded F-16. So it didn't quite work out the way we thought. And, and my my thought on this is, and this is a serious question: How many program managers have we had on the F-35 since the inception? Does anybody know the answer to that question? Several. Um, only one of which I can think of that was fired. <laughs> you know, but. But when, you know, years ago, and it's, it may be a not, not an ample comparison, but Admiral Rickover took over the, started the submarine program with the Nautilus program and stayed with it until God knows he was how old, but, and took responsibility for every single submarine, every single submarine program. And everyone knew who to call if there was a problem. And, uh, and right now, you know, but some of these programs, I, if we put a young officer and say, look, you're going to be with this program until you leave, and you're going to get all your ups, you're going to get all that. But I, I, I think there's got to be a better way to do this because what we've been doing hasn't been working. So I just wanted to throw my two cents in 
on that, and I, I know you put a lot of thought on that, and everybody else has, but um, it is a problem. Okay, uh, Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, I understand there have been some critiques of their forces testing on hypersonic weapons um, uh, due in part to the low number of glide vehicle test events along with limited availability of hypersonic flight corridors, target areas, and test support assets. Um, is this true? And if so, what resources are necessary to increase the capacity for hypersonic glide vehicle, glide vehicle testing? Yeah, we do have issues with test capacity and, and availability of ranges essentially to do some of our hypersonic testing. Um, I don't have any details for you about, uh, I know there's been a substantial investment in uh, improved infrastructure to support hypersonic testing. I'd have to get you an answer for the record on, on the, the content of that. I haven't followed that, that closely myself. I, I appreciate it. General Salzman, uh, we're investing significant resources into space-based tracking of hypersonic threats, and this is critical uh, for our defense capabilities. Uh, it would be logical that, that such a system uh, would be trained against real-world scenarios, um, uh, you know, given what the, the secretary's you know, indicated to, you know, how do we trust, test these tracking capabilities you know, under your programs, and where do, where do these uh, priorities kind of reconcile, and where do they meet? That's a great question. We, I, th I would say we have a three-pronged approach to that. Uh, anywhere we can use uh, digital simulations, we are leveraging that to the max extent possible. Uh, there will be some range testing to try to calibrate the systems as they go into orbit. And real-world live events, it, we never miss an opportunity to take advantage of those. And unfortunately, these days, there are those events to, to look at. So uh, we don't have all the complement on orbit yet to be able to, uh, to fully test that um, uh, as an operational capability, but we're going to rapidly get there in the next year or so. When do you expect a more robust kind of launch um, uh, uh, ability to? The, the, the low, the proliferated warfighter space architecture that our space development agency is putting, putting together is the sensors that will be able to track the hypersonics. Uh, between tw we're going to start tranche one delivery later this year, and by FY26, we should have enough on orbit to be able to demonstrate the capability. And we'll have enough data to, to make that decision? We'll be okay. testing all every time there's a launch in checkout, we test that information, we test the data. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since Mr. Hegelar brought up the hypersonic program, I, I just real quick comment on that. You know, we have the Navy program, obviously, we have the Army program, we have the Air Force program. Uh, Lockheed has the interest in all three of the programs. And obviously, from, from our perspective, it's, uh, it's been somewhat uh, frustrating. I, I think uh, so far in all three programs, uh, we've been spending about $3.5 billion a year uh, to get to a hypersonic missile, and we have yet to get there on any of the programs. And as far as I know, it's a classified number, but the Chinese, I'll just say at least 1,000 hypersonic missiles that are maneuverable. Uh, and, you know, I, I was around when Mike Griffin did the first test, and I think you were around too uh, at that time on the hypersonic program back in 96 when we did the first hypersonic missile test and got the speed. It was a successful test. We offered it to the Air Force. They turned it down. The Chinese stole the technology, perfected it, and uh, deployed it. Um, I, you know, I had to get my frustration out, but here we are, uh, spent, I think, well, well over $10, $12 billion, and uh, we're yet to get there. So it's uh, not good. Mr. Fleischman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, and General Salzman, let me join my colleagues on both sides of the aisle for well-deserved accolades uh, to all of you all. Thank you for your tremendous service to our nation. It's a privilege to be with you today. Uh, gentlemen, as, as you may be aware, I, am, I chair the Energy and Water Subcommittee of Appropriations, uh, and I'm well aware that the highest priority of DOD and NNSA is completing the nuclear recapitalization program of record. We recognize the Air Force has a tremendous role with the responsibility for both the ICBM and strategic bomber legs of the triad, as well as the NC3 infrastructure, along with the Space Force and the Navy. I want to thank all the airmen, missileers, submariners, and guardians that protect our nation and our allies every day. Unfortunately, we are 
uh, experiencing schedule delays and cost overruns that have become all too common with major programs. I recognize the greatest challenge we face is probably workforce. As with military recruitment, we have a shortage of the necessary skilled personnel from program managers to engineers to technicians and tradesmen. After decades of underinvestment, we are now paying to relearn costly lessons. All the while, the Russians have suspended New START, even though they seem to be keeping to the treaty limits for now. It expires in less than two years. China is, meanwhile, rapidly expanding its nuclear forces and could catch us within a decade. We are entering uncharted territory, dealing with two peer nuclear adversaries, as we are in the middle of recapitalizing our entire deterrent uh, with just a time of schedule. Question, what is the Air Force doing to keep Sentinel and B-21 schedules from slipping further, and how can Congress better help ensure that there's not an unacceptable dip in force structure once we begin replacing legacy systems? Uh, B-21 is roughly on schedule. It's still in development. It's, it's in test flight. Uh, I wouldn't make any commitments or promises about what will happen going forward, but to date it's executed fairly well. Sentinel is the opposite story, basically. I'm recused on Sentinel. I'll let uh, General Alvin talk about that. Uh, it's going through the Noma Curdy and General uh, Dr. LaPlante is, is, is running that process, uh, and we'll come out of that with a recommendation about how to proceed on Sentinel. Uh, but I think I'm pretty comfortable with as much as I can be at this point in time with where B-21 is. Thank you, sir. The, the only thing I'd, I'd add is on Sentinel. Again, it's, it's one of those uh, – Secretary Kendall talked earlier about some of the challenges in the acquisition process, and some of those is maybe underestimating what some of the complexity is. And I think um, perhaps we'll discover that – it, the, the two parts of the Sentinel program, one is actually the technology and the missile and all that, and the other was actually the scope and scale of what is really the largest civil works program that we've had in the Department of Defense for a long time. Maybe there was an underappreciation of that. So we're, the, the drivers of the cost is something that's going uh, at uh, Dr. Plant is going through in, in the non Curdy review. And we, again, you, the point you made, your opening point, is the right one, Congressman. We, we have to be committed to a safe, effective, and reliable triad. So whatever the non Curdy review uh, delivers for us. We're going to be supportive and we're going to deal with that because, uh, as you mentioned, the threats are not sitting idly by while we sort out what we do with our triad. Thank you, sir. Follow-up question. With the expiration of New START in less than two years, can you commit to this committee that the Air Force is preparing contingency plans now in cooperation with NNSA to upload Minuteman 3 and recertify more B-52s for nuclear missions? Um, there are some discussions happening in the policy framework. Uh, what to happen? What will happen if Russia does not stay in compliance? And also to react, to, as you mentioned, the China's growing arsenal. Uh, at this point in time, um, I, we don't have any specific plans in place or any specific intentions. Uh, but I think we'd have to get into a classified forum to talk about those options in any more detail. I understand. Thank you uh, for your answer, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Ms. McCullough. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, climate change is a costly impact to our national security. It shows up in cracks in cement, large temperature swings, from cold weather to warm weather, soil erosion leading to sinkholes, damage from significant weather events. Uh, it's an environmental stressor on our infrastructure, and the Department has long recognized this. In addition to the operational stress of more frequent rocket launches at launch sites, General uh, Saltzman, you are now working through a plan to collect fees from industry to recoup some of the indirect costs for operations at the launch pads, and implementation could start as early as this summer. Now, from an appropriation standpoint, we'll want to have visibility on, on how and where such funds are spent. Uh, the chairman and I served on the Interior Committee where there's fees collected. I know that when uh, they decided to collect fees on passports, we have seen, except for during COVID and some of the challenges we had that, we, we've seen great success in, in, in passport um, things. So fees can be a really good good thing to happen. But I think we need to clarify the language and we need to work on that together. I think it's important that those fees be clearly reinvested in the facilities both to improve their resiliency and to handle the workload, and that's what the industry is going to expect. 
So um, that means transparency, proper accounting uh, on these collections and expenditures. So we, I would like to learn more, and I, I'm sure the committee would too, on that. And along with that comes um, when you and I met earlier talking about a clean audit. This might be a great place to start to get a clean audit. So we've got the Marine Corps. We've got one of our other uh, intelligence agencies doing it. And I think Space Force can be next. So any comments you want to make, sir? Yes, ma'am. Well, we definitely owe you a, um, a, a plan for how we plan to utilize those indirect costs, the authorities that we've been given. It's up to $5 million, I think, is the cap per provider. Uh, but we, we owe you that mechanism, and we'll come back to you and show you exactly how we plan uh, to exercise those authorities. Uh, and I left uh, the Hill the other day after you talked to us about the audit. I went straight to the Vice Chief of Space Operations, and I said, tell me what it would take to give us a clean audit. And so they're going through uh, now in detail to try to figure out what the, what the limb facts might be. I almost forgot you, Mr. Joyce. I'd never want to do that, but uh, you're recognized. Very kind, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, <laughs> um, <clears throat> after uh, Mr. Edgar came in and took over, I figured that you know, I was back to the bottom of the list. But um, thank you all for being here. Uh, and thank you, especially men and women in the back row as well, for your service to our country. And I apologize when I saw my wife texting me. That's one that, and then somehow I hit, I don't know what the hell I hit, but it started playing that funky music. So uh, I apologize for that. Sec Secretary Kendall, uh, Youngstown Air Force Reserve uh, Station is in my district. And we also have four active national Air National Guard wings in the state of Ohio. In February, you unveiled your plan, uh, reoptimization efforts for the Air Force and Space Force. Can you share your insight? on how the Air Force plans on incorporating the Air Force Reserve and Air National Guard bases into the new proposed reorganization of the service? Um, the, the overarching answer is that, that no major changes should be expected. Uh, what we're doing is to try to ensure that we are, we're focused on the pacing challenge, the threat that's most dominant right now, uh, and ensuring that we have in place orchestrational structures, mostly in the active Air Force and the active Space Force, that are focused on keeping us competitive over time and keeping us as ready with the current force as we can be at all times. Uh, the Guard and the Reserves are both very much a part of that readiness equation. And what, what will probably happen is there'll be a look at how readiness is assessed for those units uh, to ensure that the right standards and so on are in place and the right uh, assessment mechanisms are in place. We want to make sure that our units that are intended to be deployable to support an operations plan have everything they need so that they can go do that and that they're really ready to go deploy. And that would apply to some of those units as well. So there are some things on the margin that might change because of this, but I don't think anything fundamental is expected to change. General Alvin, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think Secretary has it just right. I think uh, when we look at the manner in which we look at changing how we're going to present forces to the combatant commands. It's been different. For the last 20 years, we've been sort of crowdsourcing yeah. our Air Force. And we've sort of been privileging the preservation of the installation at the expense of perhaps the combat unit they'd sort of meet over there in theater. We can't do that in the Indo-Pacific. And so as we change that, we need to understand what exactly is it going to take for a unit that sits together uh, behind the fence line in, in, a, in a given in, uh, installation or a wing what do they need, as the Secretary said, to be able to pick up, deploy on short notice, go someplace, generate combat power, sustain that combat in a way we haven't done that before. So General Lowe and General Healy were there at the inception of this. And I asked them, I said, how do you see the Guard and Reserves playing into this? And they said, we, we share ourselves perfectly because we were designed to be that. We all sort of were designed to be that way. We just sort of started presenting forces differently. And so we are looking as we start doing our exercises, how we can include whole guard units, whole reserve units in a manner that's consistent with their volunteerism, but will still enable them to do the training, just like the active duty force, to be these deployable combat wings and go and exercise against what we think the pacing challenges in the Indo-Pacific. One of the things we discovered we were doing is we were crowdsourcing in order to deploy units. We would send, say, a fighter squadron to the Middle East somewhere and all the supporting functions that had to go with it to make it you know, fully functional 
we would crowdsource across the Air Force, including elements out of the Guard and Reserves. So we're picking a few people here, a few people there, a few people there. That's not the way you want to go into a combat zone, into a war. You want to have a unit that's cohesive, that's trained together, that's ready to go, deploy together, and fight together. And we got away from that for efficiency reasons, because the environment we were deploying into wasn't a combat zone. It was essentially a, a relatively benign area. So that will be a change that people may see, that those opportunities to do individual or just a few people uh, kind of deployments may not be there anymore, because we're trying to have units that can deploy as opposed to pickup games, if you will, that we put together at the last minute. Fair enough. Uh, Secretary, the Air Force is expecting its fleet to drop below 5,000 aircraft in FY25. Your budget proposes cutting hundreds of aircraft and repurposing those funds for research and development. Are you concerned that the Air Force is prioritizing quality over quantity with aircraft and that we could still deter our adversaries with a fleet of less than 5,000 aircraft? Um, we are making some difficult trade-offs, and both capacity and, and capability matter. Uh, Congressman Garcia talked about that earlier. Um, the aircraft that we're retiring or divesting are aircraft that have, are generally reaching the age, end of their service life and or they're no longer effective against the pacing threat. And so retaining those aircraft and carrying the cost of sustaining them uh, is really would, would keep us from moving forward as fast as we need to. So I think we've got the balance about right. I'll let General Alban add to that. Um, it, it, you know, if we had more resources, I think I would be prioritizing modernization still over, over retention of older force structure that's not going to be effective against the pacing challenge. Yeah, I would just add numbers for numbers. This year specifically, about 250 were divesting. Uh, of those, 56 are A-10, 65 are the F-15Cs and Ds because those are sort of running out of, of service life as well. 22 are in the T-1s. We talked about how we're shifting to simulator from the, the aircraft to, to be able to increase velocity through the pipeline. The C-130s are transitioning one for one. The KC-135s are one for one with KC-46. And uh, the EC-130, we're losing one EC-130. We're gaining an E-5, E-837. So as we look at the overall quantity for quality, I, would, I think I would rather have a smaller number of aircraft that maybe can win than a larger number of these F, uh, F 56 A-10s that probably aren't going to help against the China fight. Sure. I know who will take those A-10s. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, one quick comment, and I think I'll wrap the, the hearing up, uh, unless uh, Ms. McCallum has any additional comments. Uh, uh, as you know, as we all know, uh, back in the old days, uh, the R and D budgets were in the mil in the U.S. government. I mean, that was where the that was where all the everything happened. So all the all the uh, bells and whistles were over there. But uh, nowadays, its commercial side is uh, quite frankly are the ones that are coming up with the primary innovations, and we adapt those innovations in the Department of Defense. So uh, certainly in the communications, satellites, on down the road, especially I think this applies to the, uh, the space side, uh, I'm certainly encouraged by your emphasizing leveraging these commercial capabilities because uh, uh, we need to take advantage. This, this nation, we're still ahead on many things, and so uh, we need to, to do that. And I'll be concerned about uh, how much funding we have in FY25 in that commercial in that commercial arena but before we conclude i want to thank the witnesses for their testimony today subcommittee members are welcome to submit questions for the record i ask that the witnesses respond in a reasonable time amount uh, time uh, uh, time and with that the subcommittee stands adjourned